Good evening, welcome to Greater Vision Baptist Church. Turn with me to song number 340. My number got changed. Song number 341, excuse me. Song number 341, Victory in Jesus. Let's stand together and sing it. Song number 341. Lift your voice out now in victory with me. I heard an all. the truth of God's word is how things dovetail. I, I, I think this is a uh, very interesting how this works out. Last night we heard a great message about how uh, salvation or the, the faith that's required for, for salvation is the same salvation that's required for living out our sanctification. Amen. Amen. And just like, the, like that, we need Jesus for salvation. Amen. We need Jesus for victory, victory for, from hell and sin and the grave but also victory in our daily living. Amen. Amen. As we depend upon Jesus, we can have victory today. This is not just about salvation, not just about what happened to us 20 years ago, 10 years ago, but what we can experience today living and depending upon Jesus. Re remember that as we sing it on the second now. I heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again. Last night, Brother Britton was leading singing, and he had cut his finger at, at work, and it just started bleeding. There was blood all over the place up here last night. I don't know if you're aware of that, but he just took off skedaddle, and it was just very interesting. That was the first. I'd never experienced that one before, but you, you wouldn't have known it because he kept his composure so well. I was so grateful for the way he handled himself in that. Boy, what a great day today. What a great day. I have heard 
so many wonderful things about the ladies meeting. Mrs. Van Gelderen, thank you so much. What a blessing that was, letting the Lord use you like that. And I know you ladies were encouraged and challenged. And man, I have to say, you have to find somebody, fellas, who has a picture of that. You've heard of a charcuterie board. This is our charcuterie table. And it was just unbelievable. And you need to see a picture of that. But I appreciate all the work all the work by all the ladies who made today so special. And I'm looking forward to what God has for us tonight. Amen. It's good having friends from Greater Cumberland Baptist Church up with us. God bless you. Thank you for coming up to be a part of the night. It's been a great week. Why don't we stop and ask God to bless our time together. Lord, we love you. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Lord, what a great day. Honestly, Lord, for me, what a great week. And Lord, honestly, Everything just leading up to this week has just been so encouraging. And God, I pray that you would tonight, in a special way, work in our hearts. I think of our friends who are watching by way of the live stream. God, I pray that you would meet with them in a very real way, right where they are. But Lord, I pray that we would be more like Christ and you would restore unto us the joy of our salvation tonight, Heavenly Father, please. May you receive all the glory, God, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Right, find song number 223. This is one of my, one of my favorites from uh, our dear saint, Fanny Crosby. And it comes from a verse that uh, Dr. Flanders, evangelist, historian, Baptist preacher, Dr. Flanders, I remember preaching one, one, uh, one, at one point uh, from this particular verse that I think this song comes from. And this verse, I believe, encapsulates the word revival. And as uh, James chapter 4 and verse 8, draw an eye to God and he will draw an eye to you. And that, to me, that's just such a beautiful truth that we can, as, as much as we want to have a relationship with God and be close to God, we can. And he will honor our coming to him. Sing with me, song number 223. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice. Sing out from your heart. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it's all thy love. Two zero four, nearer, still nearer. 
close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. Sing as a prayer this evening with me. Nearer, still nearer.
was wonderful. Praise the Lord for that. Let me give you some quick announcements if I can. Uh, don't forget, fellas, we've got our men's Bible study Saturday at 8 o'clock at Chick-fil-A. I want you to come out and join us. That would be a blessing. The food's good. The fellowship's great. The Bible study's even better. So you come out and join us for that. Don't forget, this Sunday, this Sunday, there's a brand new Sunday school class starting. For folks 20 to 40 years old, we've got some new folks visiting with us tonight that would meet that category. So John's good having you and Matt and, and Stephanie. We'd love to have you come. What a blessing that is. I'm grateful. And so we're excited about that. Pray for us. We're not looking to get our folks from other Sunday school classes. We're looking to get unchurched people. We're looking to get folks who don't come to Sunday school. So help me with that if you would. Tell everybody about our new Sunday school class, you know, about the new Bible study that we're having. And I know that'll be a real blessing. And then don't forget our semi-annual church yard sale is scheduled for April 26th to the 27th. Uh, we're doing this to raise money for our missions trip to Michigan uh, this August. We'll be talking more about that later. But if you can help by bringing in some valuable items that you no longer use around your house, I know it'll be a blessing and we'll be able to raise some serious money. Speaking of raising money, Thank you for your faithfulness in the offering where, where our offering is going toward the expenses of the conference. If you can join me and help me with that, that would be a great blessing. We're over halfway there, uh, thanks to your giving. So we've got two more nights and I look forward to that, but I need you to help me with that, okay? So let's be faithful in our giving, amen? Let's stand together. We're the Greater Vision Baptist Church. We want to be the friendliest church known to man. Let's be friendly, let's shake some hands. Sixty-two in your hymnal, Sweet Will of God. Join me on that. 
202. Song number 202. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. <clears throat> Sing it with me on the first now. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of Dear Heavenly Father, we can't thank you enough for what you've done so far this week. We ask that you can you continue to bless the service tonight. Be with Dr. Jim as he preaches your word. Just lay your hand upon him. We ask that you bless the gift and the giver tonight. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
them are from Greater Cumberland, but Kendra doesn't get to sing with them very often, and I'm glad she was able to come down and just sing with them a little bit. That was a blessing, young man. And honestly, Nate's getting ready to head out. He didn't want to be a part of that singing group anymore, so he's taken off halfway around the world, and, uh, but that's a blessing. Young man. It's been a great week, hasn't it? It's just been a great week. God's so good to us. I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the message. Tonight, I hope you have your hearts tuned in to what God's going to say. Amen. Preacher, you come. Okay, thank you. Well, it is a delight again to be here and to see you here, and I appreciate coming back for part number two. And uh, let's go to James chapter number two, and I've got to bring a few people up to speed. I had some folks come down from, or come up, I guess. I'm going to get the geography right from Greater Cumberland, and so I appreciate them coming up the highway here up north. And um, uh, so it's good to see them here. Now, yesterday we had more on this side. Now we got more on this side, so I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, we'll just keep going on it. I have to think about this for a moment, but that's the south side, right? That's the south side, and this is the north side. So I'm, uh, little, that same thing happened down there at Greater Cumberland, I think. We got them on the wrong side of the aisle. I don't know, but anyway, and uh, maybe one side's Republican, one side's Democrat. I don't know. I'm just teasing. Okay, but anyway, uh, it certainly is... Um, uh, always wonderful when folks come to a uh, revival meeting, and I trust God is doing a work in your heart. And we have one more night for those here from uh, uh, the Greater Vision Baptist Church. I'm looking forward to being with you uh, one more uh, service. 
And uh, I'm not sure exactly how God's leading about tomorrow night. We're certainly praying for direction there. But I sense God wants us to do this two-part series on uh, really dealing with the issue of works. Where do works fit uh, in biblical sanctification and the, and the Christian life? How do they fit in? Now, several of you have joined us uh, from uh, Hoptown. Is that the nickname for Hopkinsville? I think when I was down there, I kind of got that Hoptown thing. Okay, but anyway, so those of you that are from Hoptown, I got to get you up to speed. And, uh, but anyway, we're in James chapter number two. And uh, I don't want to be too technical. Really is uh, uh, sometimes a desire. I don't want to lose you in, in the weeds and miss the greater picture of what James chapter two is trying to teach us. Uh, but uh, there's a debate over James chapter number two, and I tried to lay that out last night. And uh, there's one group of people that uh, believe James chapter two is teaching us saving faith without works is dead. And uh, I believe that is the wrong interpretation. I didn't have time to go over that again. I believe this is teaching us that sanctifying faith without works is dead. It's written to Christians. It's not written to people who claim to be saved who aren't because they're not living it. That is not, I believe, the emphasis of James chapter 2. And if you go out that window, I think you miss the greater teaching of what God's trying to teach us in James chapter number 2. Uh, I believe uh, because of the word brethren found throughout the book that God is preaching to people, or I should say through the James, is preaching through divine inspiration to God's people. And he's challenging them about issues of faith. I believe the book of James is a great book on revival and is a great book on faith, walking by faith and living out your faith, living out your Christian life. I think it's uh, emphasis on the living it out. Uh, but also, of course, it infers and even outrightly says it several times that the Christian life is a life of faith. And so we're talking about faith and the fact that it produces uh, works. It produces good works. And uh, so um, uh, we're going to be talking about that uh, here tonight, continuing the message. Last night we dealt with the fact that faith, genuine faith, results in obedience. Sometimes I'll use the word works and obedience interchangeably. But uh, we saw last night that faith results in obedience and that obedience delivers us. Supernaturally delivers us from things from which we need to be delivered. Sometimes we need to be delivered from the deadness of carnality. Sometimes we need to be delivered from unbelief. Sometimes we need to be delivered from the power of sin, but in the Christian life, uh, we need to be delivered all the time. You know, I sometimes, I can't remember if I said this down at Greater Cumberland, but it certainly bears repeating, that, um, you know, we use that terminology, accepting Jesus Christ, help me out now, as our personal Savior. And sometimes we get the idea that Jesus' saving work stopped when we got saved. And we got saved from hell. We got delivered from hell. And wow, hallelujah, that's an eternal salvation. Thank the Lord for it, by the way. But I, may I say this? Uh, when you, uh, maybe I could change this for a moment without changing it. Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal fireman? Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal rescue worker? Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal EMT? Have you ever accepted Jesus as your personal um, deliverer? Okay, the point is this. You say, preacher, why did you use those words? They're synonyms of the word Savior. And may I say, when you got saved, Jesus' saving work didn't stop. It started. Amen. And every day of your Christian life, you need a personal rescuer. Now, you may be a better Christian than I am, but I need, I need Jesus to be my personal rescuer every moment of every day. And if you don't believe that, just ask my wife. Okay, you know what I'm saying? I need deliverance. I bet you you do too. And uh, so Jesus is our personal deliverer. And how does he do it? Well, James 2 tells us how he does it. When we believe him enough to God-dependently obey him and dependence on him, uh, then uh, he delivers us. And by the way, we're not talking about an obedience that grits its teeth and says, uh, I'm going to do it if it kills me. It, it's not flesh-dependent obedience. Because the Bible tells us the flesh profits anybody know? Anybody know? Nothing. Okay, it's not talking about flesh-dependent obedience. It's talking about God-dependent obedience. And that kind of obedience delivers us. We talked about that last night, spent the whole time on that. Now let's go back to James chapter number 2. And part of the message isn't apologetic, and I apologize for that. But I'm trying to defend the view that I believe is the biblical view. So I have to go through things. 
So before we get into the message, I do see a, a verse here that probably needs explanation that is right there in the middle uh, of, the cha of, the, of the passage, which is, of course, verse number 14 to the end of the chapter. So go, if we would, please, to verse number 19, and it kind of sets us up for where we are going to go tonight. It says in verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The demons, or the devils, excuse me, also believe and tremble. And I've heard some strange views based on that verse. Some people have said, uh, uh, I, I even had a camp director say, the way you know you're saved is not by your faith, it's by your works. And I thought, whoa, that's different. And they kind of point to these kind of verses. So you say, preacher, what's this verse saying? Okay, when the Bible says that if you believe there's one God, you do well, please understand that's not talking about salvation. Do you know that if you believe that there is one God, that doesn't save you? You know what that's saying is? It's saying that some people are monotheists, and that's correct, isn't it? Did you know that uh, um, Muslims are monotheists? They're not going to heaven. See, so what this passage of Scripture is saying is he's saying to the Jews, you believe there's one God. You believe in monotheism. Well, that's good. That is good. You do well. I mean, it is true. Even if you were lost, it's a good thing to start with at least that truth, that there's just one God. There's not a bunch of them. There's one. You do well. And basically, he was saying, well, the demons believe that. Okay, so the point I think he's making here is very clearly that um, uh, orthodoxy is not enough. Now, orthodoxy is good. The Bible says you do well if you're orthodox. You can believe the right things, friends, and if you do, that's good, but it's not enough. See, it's got to go from orthodoxy to God-dependent action. Okay, so that's kind of a bridge verse in there that's kind of bringing us uh, on our way. Okay, so let's go now to, um, we said, first of all, faith that produces works uh, delivers. Number two, faith that produces works declares. It declares. Okay, what does it declare? Okay, let's look down at verse number 21. Uh, Was not Abraham our father justified by works, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. You say, what in the world is that talking about? Uh, you say, preacher, that verse it seems like it's talking about that you get justified by works and not faith only. So what's it talking about? Well, we got to establish. Remember this. One of the great things about the Bible is this, that if you run to a problem passage, here's what you got to do. You have to interpret it in light of other clear statements of Scripture. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I want you to put a finger in James chapter number 2, and I want you to go to Romans 3. Would you do that? Go to Romans 3 and verse number 20. This is a great verse. Romans 3 and verse number 20. Now, you may not have seen this particular word in the verses we just read, but in the verses we just read, there was a little verse. Here it was. A little word, I should say, see. See. Okay, so we're going to see this verse, uh, that particular word, in Romans 3 and verse number 20. So look, will you please, with me to Romans 3.20. You've got to see this. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, help me out now, there shall, could you say the next two words? No flesh be justified, now say the next three words, in his sight. Okay, may I say this carefully? That if you're out here, I'm going to just tell you right now, that if you're trusting good works to get you to heaven and to make you righteous in the sight of God, you will never get there. The Bible says nobody is justified in the sight of God by the good things they do. That's what it says. You say, well, preacher, how do you, how do you reconcile that with James chapter number 2? Well, notice this, friends. When did, when did Abraham get saved? Did he get saved when he offered Isaac or was willing to offer Isaac on the altar? Is that when he got saved? No. He got saved 30 years before. In Genesis 15, 6, when the Bible says he believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. That's when he got saved. Scholars say it was 30 years. Some say it was 50. But it was a long time. That's when he got saved. So you say, preacher, what's James chapter 2 talking about? Okay, we got Romans 3.20. This is going to help us. Now go to James, back to James chapter number 2. 
And I want you to see something. This is really neat. Okay, so I want you to look at verse 22. And here's what I'm going to do in verse 22. I'm going to say the first word in verse 22. I want you to say the second. Are you ready? Okay, so here it is. Verse 22. Seest. Oh. Okay, now in verse 24, I want you to say the first word, and I'm going to say the second word. So the first word in verse 24 is? See. Okay, so in whose sight is Abraham being justified in James chapter 2? And the answer is, in the sight of us. <laughs> but in Genesis 15, 6, whose sight was Abraham being justified in the sight of? And the answer is, in the sight of God. So may I say this, friends, in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham got saved. And when he did, when he believed God, he was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was justified, declared to be righteous in the sight of Almighty God. But 30 years later, uh, when he offered Isaac upon the altar and God provided the lamb substitute, he was justified in the sight of men. Now, isn't it interesting in this passage of Scripture that Lot is not used? Now, I want to ask you an honest question. Was Lot saved? You know, if all we had was the Old Testament, we'd have a hard time putting Lot in heaven, wouldn't we? Well, that rascal, he's a big faker. He was acting like he was a Christian when he really wasn't. Well, in 2 Peter chapter number 2, three times God uses the word righteous. When you get to heaven, you are going to see Lot. Now, don't miss this. Lot... I don't know when, but Lot was justified in the sight of God. There was a day he believed, and he was justified in the sight of God. But you hear me, I'm not sure that Lot was ever justified in the sight of men. Don't, don't miss this. The only way people know that you are a true believer in Jesus Christ is by God-dependent, supernatural, enabled obedience works. That's how you're justified in the sight of men. Now, sometimes, I'll be honest with you, friends, there's just several things I could say, but recently, I, I, I just, uh, I came across an article just a couple of days ago about a well-known atheist, I think it was Richard Dawkins, if I remember it correctly, and Dawkins basically said, uh, it would be tragic if Islam became the dominant religion in, in Britain, or was it America, I can't remember, he said it would be tragic. He said, there's no doubt about it, Christianity is superior religion, and even though I don't believe it's true, it, it's, it needs to be the dominant religion. Now, why would he say that? I'm going to tell you why. Because true Christianity, when people are living, walking with Jesus, true Christianity, how do I say this, it blesses a culture. <laughs> they know that it's good. In fact, years ago I was reading an article and there was a man uh, who grew up in Africa who was British. His dad was some, some uh, government official and a pretty high up. And he was raised in Africa, and here's what he said. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. But he said, Africa needs Christianity. He said, everywhere Christianity goes, he said, corruption get, is gone, and, and uh, good things happen in the culture, and, and the economy begins to work. He said, no, don't get me wrong. I don't believe in God. But he said, uh, Africa needs Christianity. Do you know those people are speaking out of both sides of their mouth, both Dawkins and that other atheist speaking out of the mouth? What they're saying is, they're saying there's something different about Christianity. Now, where does that come from? It comes from Christians who are not just justified in the sight of God, they're justified in the sight of men by believing God enough to obey Him in God-dependent obedience. 1971, there's a guy named Bill McLeod. Has anybody ever gotten the Internet and watched about an hour-long lecture by Bill McLeod from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Anybody at all? Okay, you might want to go home tonight, get on YouTube, and put in Bill McLeod, M-C-L-E-O-D. Okay, that's how it's spelled, Saskatoon Revival. Bill McLeod, 1971, was pastoring a church in, in Saskatoon, and they had, I'm telling you, an old-fashioned, shingle-rattling, Holy Ghost revival. And it shook the city. They were filling the largest auditoriums like for five or six weeks. It didn't start out big, but it grew to be big. And there was a, there was a, um, a chief of police in Saskatoon that uh, said, I don't, I don't believe in God. He said, I'm an atheist. But he said, I believe in revival. He said, in my entire police career, he said, I have never had happen what happened in the revival in Saskatoon. He said, during that revival, he said, we had scores of people come to the police department and confess unsolved crimes. 
He said, that has never happened in my entire police career. He said, don't get me wrong, I don't believe in God, but I do believe in revival. Well, he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth too. You know what that Saskatoon guy was saying? He was saying this. You know, when Christians walk by faith and trust God and obey Him, culture knows something's going on. It declares them to be righteous in the sight of men. So Abraham, again, let me get it clearly, Genesis 15, 6, he was declared righteous in the sight of God. Why? He believed. Man couldn't see that happen. God could, but we couldn't. But 30 years later, when he was willing to sacrifice his son in, in, in obedience to the Lord, and God provided the lamb as a great picture of the Lord Jesus' substitutionary death, I will tell you, friends, he was justified in the sight of men. You say, okay, preacher, yeah, I can see that. But you've got a problem, preacher. It's the last part of the chapter is talking about Rahab. So what about her? Oh, I love Rahab, because I want to tell you, let's go to Rahab now. At the end, of, we got we to see this. Let's go to Rahab. Look what she says here. Look what it says. It says, uh, verse number 24, You see then how by works a man is justified, not by faith only. And notice again that key is ye see. Likewise also, okay, so we're in the same vein of thinking. The word likewise helps us with that. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. You say, preacher, what about that? Well, that's really good. So we got to find out when did Rahab get saved. Do you know the Bible tells us when Rahab got saved? Go just a page back to Hebrews 11. Would you do that? Hebrews 11, look at verse number 31. It tells us when Rahab the harlot got saved. Look what it says in verse 31. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when, what does it say, she received the spies in peace. Do you know when Rahab got saved? She got saved the moment she took those Hebrew spies and she invited them into her house. She also was trusting God to be her God. She got saved at that moment. The Bible says she did. That's when she got saved. Go back to James chapter number two. You're going to see something fascinating here. Okay, so I say this. When was Rahab justified in the sight of God? When she received the spies in peace. That's when she believed. But notice what it says here. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers, here it is, and had sent them out another way. So don't miss this. Rahab was justified in the sight of God when she received the spies, but she was justified in the sight of the spies when she protected them, risked her own life, and sent them out another way. Isn't it interesting? Abraham is 30 years, and I tease Rahab is 30 minutes. It didn't take those spies long for thinking, this lady is one of us. But if she had never obeyed God and protected the spies and sent them out another way, they'd have never know she was justified. Have you ever noticed secret believers? Nobody knows they're saved. I understand that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, according to church tradition, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, gave their lives for the gospel. But for many years, nobody even knew they were saved. And what God is trying to tell us here, as friends, is this. That true uh, uh, sanctifying faith and our Christian life faith, we want to put it this way. Christian life faith lets a lost and dying world know that we're different, that we're saved. And without that, we may be justified in the sight of God, but we're not justified in the sight of men. Can I say this carefully? I'm not trying to be unkind. Maybe there's somebody here at the workplace. God knows you're saved, but your coworkers don't. You've been justified in the sight of God. I'm not doubting your salvation this, morning, this evening. I'm just saying God wants you to be justified in the sight of men. Oh, let me give you this illustration because this is about a missionary. Okay. Um, years ago, I, I saw a video, and I've seen it many times, and it always stirs me. Some of you are even going to know the name of the missionary, but he was a, a missionary to Irian Jaya, which is third world country. And um, he got over there, and he didn't know their customs, and he wanted a, a bunch of agriculture, so he hired the nationals to plant, you know, banana trees and coconut trees and all kinds of things that were tropical fruits, and, and uh, they did. But he noticed that as soon as harvest would come, they'd steal. They'd steal the fruit. And he would get angry at them. I mean, he was frustrated. He was angry. Uh, see, in their culture, if you planted it, you owned it. But he didn't know that. 
So they would constantly steal from him. They'd come into his house and they'd take, you know, knives and forks and they'd make necklaces. He'd see his forks hanging around people's necks, you know, as he's around the village. And he'd just get furious, just blow up at them. And uh, pretty soon he became known as, in their language, as the angry missionary. That was his, that was his title. There's the angry missionary. And so uh, he got so angry that he, he got a German shepherd dog. And the, the, they were so scared of dogs that everybody left the village. And he loved his two weeks of vacation. He loved it. But after about two weeks, he realized, you know, I don't have any missionary. I don't have any ministry here. The nationals are gone. I chased away the dog. So he had to get rid of the dog. And they all came back. I mean, it was that kind of back and forth and, and um, didn't have a lot of fruit that, uh, not literally, but you know I'm talking about spiritual fruit. He didn't, have that. he didn't have the literal fruit either. But anyway, he goes back to the United States and he goes to uh, some different things and he, God just hammers him. And uh, there comes a day where he just gets right with God about his anger, about everything. And, and the way he, he handled it was, okay, God, everything I own is now yours. So those trees aren't mine. The agriculture's not mine. My silverware's not mine. It's all yours. And if they take it, you got to deal with it. I'm not dealing with it anymore. It's yours. So he gave everything to God, went back to the mission field, and guess what happened? He wasn't angry anymore. They could steal from him, and they'd come to him, so why aren't you angry? He said, well, it's not mine anymore. They said, well, who did you give it to? Oh, I gave it to the God that created all this. Well, that really worried him. So, uh, so uh, they, uh, they, he was just, they saw he was totally different. So one day, the natives or the nationals gathered at his front porch, and he said that that culture, uh, kind of be nice in educational institutions if we had this in our culture, but in that culture, if you were thinking, they would rub their nose. So you always knew when they were thinking, they rubbed their nose. Wouldn't that be nice, teachers? If you knew your kids were thinking, they were rubbing their nose. Okay, so anyway. And so he said they had these nationals out on the front, and they're all rubbing their noses. And they said, Mr. Missionary, we've got a question for you. He said, before you, well, it said, first of all, he said, Are, have you become a Christian? And he said, what do you mean? He said, well, the last time you were here before you left, uh, you talked about people becoming a Christian, and we always wondered if we'd ever see one. <laughs> but now that you've come back, you're different. And we're just wondering, have you become a Christian? Now, don't miss this, friend. Do you know what that missionary did? He humbled himself. And you know what he said? Yes. I have become a Christian. Do you know what he was saying? You know, years before nationals, before you ever knew me, I became justified in the sight of God. But those last four years, I wasn't justified in your sight. But God's changing me. And now I've become a Christian. In your eyes, I am justified in the sight of your eyes. Do you see it, friends? Lost people will not believe that God is real without seeing it in our own lives. With God-dependent obedience that results in those good works, it declares us to be righteous in man's sight. We're already justified in his sight. Okay, hopefully you're getting that. Okay, now that brings me to the last one. There's one more thing we see here in uh, James chapter number 2 that faith, God-dependent, uh, uh, God dependence produces a God dependent uh, works and it does something else. Okay, so let's go to verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. Okay, now what's that talking about? Now, this is a little technical and I don't want to get too technical here, but I want to read something from a guy by the name of Lenski. Now, Lenski, theologically, I would not agree with him on a lot of things, but he's a Greek scholar and in the truest sense of the word. And uh, he, uh, I won't read all this technical stuff because it would probably go over most of our heads, including mine. But anyway, uh, this is what he said. Talk about works. They, works, are produced by true faith. That's what he's saying this verse is talking about. They, works, are produced by true faith. And the faith, don't miss this, uses the works as its means. Say, what's that talking about? Well, go back, look at it. It says, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and here it is, and by works. For years I would make this statement. Hey, in theology, faith is always the means. Works are never a means. I would say that in theology. Well, that's true in some sense. You could say by faith, not by works. 
You, you, you have a sure salvation primarily. You obviously get that by faith, not by works. Talked about that last night. You, you get victory over sin, uh, not, by, uh, not by faith, not by works. Okay, and so I would make, you know, works are never a means. And then I read James chapter number two. What are you going to do when the Bible says that works is a means? It's not a means for salvation, but it is a means. You say, what's it a means for? Okay. Now, Linsky says, according to the Greek, and this is technical, but Linsky says, according to the Greek, because of the imperfect tense, I know that means nothing to you, that's okay, but because of the imperfect tense, it actually is expecting an aorist. You say, why did you say that? Because somebody in this room would understand that, but probably very few. But anyway, in other words, that imperfect tense is saying there's, there's, that, that God's doing this for a reason, and there are three aorist tenses. So you say, what does that mean? Okay, I'm just going to put right down where you live. Works is a means for three things. That's what it means. In other words, a faith, true faith, results in obedience. And that obedience becomes a means for three things. Which means the absence of uh, God-dependent obedience means you have no means for these three things. These aren't going to happen. You say, wow, what are those three aorist tenses? Whatever that means. Okay, well, here they are. Let's just look at them. Okay, so I'm trying to be, I'm trying to give you a little bit of the background. I'm not trying to be too technical, but um, okay, let's look at what I'm going to show you what they are, and then we'll go back and look at them. See as to how faith wrought with his works. Here it is. And by works, there's our means. First of all, was faith made perfect. Number two, and the scripture was fulfilled. Number three, and he was called the friend of God. Now, I don't want you to miss this. There are three things. When you and I believe God enough to obey him, that obedience becomes a means for three things. Number one, perfected faith. That word perfect, perf uh, perfected is the same word Jesus used on the cross when he said, it is finished. It has the idea of completed faith. Can I say this, friend? You know what happens when you and I believe God enough to obey him? He matures our faith. Amen. He grows our faith. He perfects our faith. I've told my girls, Christian maturity is not sinlessness. Christian maturity is the ability to counsel yourself out of your problems. You know you're mature as a believer when you say, okay, I know what my problem is. I know what the answer is. And you can counsel yourself out of your problems. That's Christian maturity. And you know how you get there? By believing God enough to obey him. And in that obedience, do you know what God begins to do? He perfects your faith. And without that, your faith... Listen, people who don't obey Jesus don't have very much faith. Their faith is crippled. It is in the obedience that something miraculously happens to your faith. It's not you trying to have greater faith. It's God miraculously perfecting your faith. Amen. Wow, that's like amazing. Now, we're going to come back to that in a moment. But look at the next thing. This is amazing. It says, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, may I say this, friends? When you got saved. You were in the sight of God. God saw you as righteous. Now understand something. That righteous was legal. That light righteous, uh, right righteousness was forensic. You say, what do you mean by that? When you and I stand before God, hallelujah, we're not going to be judged on our righteousness, which would be filthy rags. We're going to be judged on his we will be in the sight of God declared to be righteous. And although, don't miss this, justification means we're legally and forensically righteous. It doesn't stop there. Can I say this carefully? You are really righteous. You say, I really am? Yeah, inside of you, the real you, and we talked about this a little bit at Greater Cumberland, that who you really are, that is righteous. Jesus Christ, you got born again. Jesus Christ, move in. He regenerated your spirit. And that part of you, the new man, is created in righteousness and true holiness. That righteousness is not just legal and forensic. It is, but it's bigger than that. It's real. You say, well, Richard, I need righteousness. We all do. You know what the Bible says about our righteousness? All? Hang on now. This is going to be a little rough. 
of our righteousnesses are as, anybody know? Ooh, you know what I used to think that said? All of your righteousnesses. I thought, right, you know, Isaiah's up there on a soapbox preaching. Okay, you scoundrels out there, you think you're righteous. You're out there trying to get to heaven by good works. Yeah, your righteousness is filthy rags. No, that's not what he was preaching to. He said, our. When we get to heaven, is Isaiah going to be there? He wasn't talking about lost people. He's talking about us. I'm going to say this carefully. Flesh dependent righteousness stinks in the nostrils of of God. There are going to be independent Baptists, fundamentalists, stand before God and shocked at how much is burned up. You know why? Because it was them. Yeah. Filthy rags. Yeah. So, well, preacher, then what do I do? I'll tell you what you do. In total dependence on Jesus, obey Him, trusting Him to enable you to do what you cannot do, and you will find that His imputed righteousness, don't miss this, becomes imparted righteousness. It's not your righteousness, it's his. Duncan Campbell in the Great Revival in Lewis said this, it's not my holiness, but his. That's the secret to victory. And see, friends, what I believe this is saying is, if you want the real righteousness when you got saved and your new man was created in righteousness and true holiness, then you have to believe God enough to obey him. And in that total dependence on him, that total dependent obedience, guess what happens? In his enablement, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. It is his righteousness. It's not human. It's supernatural. And that imputed righteousness has become imparted righteousness. So you know what the Bible is saying? When Abraham went up there and was willing to offer his promised son, believing that God would resurrect him, you know what was happening? It was all, it was a God moment. It's not a father in this room can imagine doing that. So whatever Abraham was doing, we know God was on the deal. And his imputed righteousness was becoming imparted righteousness. And the Bible says the scripture was filled. Do you know, my friend, God wants that to be fulfilled in your life. When you got saved, you were made righteous in the sight of God. God wants that righteousness to come out. <laughs> Imputed righteousness to become imparted righteousness. That's the second thing that happens when you and I believe God enough to obey Him. That obedience becomes a means for imparted righteousness. Number three, it's called the friend of God. Do you know, my friend, you know, when you walked into Abraham's office, you didn't see a little name plaque, Abraham, friend of God. No, 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 no. It wasn't on his office door. You know why he was called the friend of God? Not because he called him that. Everybody else did. You say, see that guy over there? That guy loves God. That guy was willing to sacrifice his son. That guy, something different about that guy. You know, there's many men and women I read of in church history, and I'll be honest with you. You know what I say to myself? I've never met them. Meet them in heaven, but I've never met them. And you know what I'm thinking? Man, that guy loved God. David Livingston. You read about David Livingston, you think, man, he was driven. Man, that guy loved God. Hudson Taylor, wow, that guy loved God. George Mueller, wow, that guy loved God. How do we know that? I mean, did one day that, that George Mueller have, have a heart surgery, and they went in and opened up, and, oh, look at this guy. Man, he's got... No, 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 that's not what happened. It was obedience. It was a, a man who was walking by faith, exhibited it by God-dependent obedience, and the world looked on and said, man, that guy loves God. He's the friend of God. So what God is trying to help us with understanding works? Works are a result of faith. But then when they are a result of faith, they turn around, and they become a means for greater faith, imparted righteousness, and being called the friend of God. May I say this, friend, disobedient Christians will never see those three things. Their faith is not going to grow. They're not going to have imparted righteousness. They're going to be a very defeated Christian. Their righteousness will be like plastic fruit. It won't be supernatural. It'll just be the best a human being can do, which isn't very good. And they will not be called the friend of God. Nobody's going around and saying, that guy loves God. No, that people will know. You know they just know. He's, he doesn't seem to be very real. 
All I'm simply saying, friends, if you walk out of this meeting and say, man, I'm going to grip my teeth and I'm going to try harder. i got to obey God. for these," You missed the whole point. It's not obedience alone. It's obedience that comes out of a total dependence on Jesus Christ. That's the obedience that's powerful because it's supernatural. Every young man in this room who's called to preach, and I'm sure some of you are, I'm sure when the moment you're called to preach, here's what you're going to do. God, you got the wrong guy. I don't know how many young men I talk to, they say, preach. but sure, I think God's calling me to preach, but you got to understand, I don't think I can do this. And you know what my answer is? I may, I'll tell you what my answer is. Who of us thought we could? Any preacher who gets called to preach, no, God, you got the wrong guy. God says, no, I don't, because I need somebody who knows he's pretty bad off, because when I do it, I don't want you taking credit. Anything supernatural has in your life, friends, I'm just telling you right now, don't take credit for it. You ever thought about this? I remember as a kid, you know, in my selfish kid, you know, mentality, one day we're going to come get all these rewards, we're going to throw them back at Jesus' feet. I'm thinking, no, I'd like to keep some of those. I'm just being honest with you, my, you know, my immaturity. I thought, why would we cast them back? I mean, I know we love Jesus, but I mean, we earned them. And I remember when it finally hit me, George Whitfield, a comment he made, and I, I'm sure I'm messing up the exact wording, but he said this. He said, uh, isn't it amazing that Jesus will reward us at the judgment seat for all the things that he did through us and everything we did will be burned up? And then it hit me. You know why we're going to throw everything back at Jesus' feet? We're going to be saying, Jesus, it was yours. You did it through me. I couldn't have done it without you. It's yours. All the stuff we did, it's gone, it's burned up. That was worthless. I'm telling you, friend, that's what obedient, God-dependent obedience. You know what God-dependent obedience does? It will shake Owensboro to the core. People say, that guy loves God. Man, that guy, something's righteous about him. Man, that guy has God all over him. I don't understand that. See, that's what James chapter 2 is trying to tell us. And here he is. He's got his congregation scattered abroad. They've just been driven out of Jerusalem because they're Christians. And what do you think their tendency is going to be? To shut their mouths. And you know what James is saying? Don't go that way. Man, live your Christian faith out. Let a lost and dying world see your obedience and your love for Jesus. And that's how we're going to reach the world. Now, let me give you one final thought because um, I just want to conclude with this. Uh, actually, the, um, when it comes right down to it, uh, faith, uh, I, I call them faith triggers. There are several things in the Bible that God says, I want you to believe them and believe them enough to obey them. And if we don't believe them enough to obey them, guess what? We will never be a, a mature believer. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, I, I believe we could debate about giving, tithing, but everybody would, I think, know that according to the New Testament, if tithing was demanded in the Old Testament, it's, it's got to be at least that or more. Okay, so, so we won't debate it, but we'll just keep it at that. Okay, can a, a believer be a mature believer without obeying Jesus when it comes to tithing and giving? And the answer is, it's impossible. If you say, preacher, I don't tithe. Okay, and I'm not trying to be unkind, I'm trying to help you. You will never be a mature believer until you believe God enough to obey him and tithe. And I remember as a kid growing up at the Marquette Matter Baptist Church, we used to have Stewardship Month every January, and they would parade men across the platform, and men would be giving testimonies at banquets. And I heard story after story of believers talking about, man, I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I could make ends meet, but I decided to believe God. And I started cutting that check and started sending my first fruits into Jesus. And you're not going to believe God did this, God did this. Man, I, I can't afford not to die. You know what I was beginning to watch them do? In that obedience, you know what God was doing? He was developing their faith. He's maturing their faith. Supernatural things were happening. So, okay, how about this? Can, can a mature, oh, this is going to be rough. Can you hang tight with me? I'm not trying to be unkind. This is going to be rough. Can a believer be a mature believer without ever asking people for forgiveness? Are, do you ever make mistakes? Do you ever, do you ever say something that hurts somebody? Do you, you ever blow it? <laughs> I, I'll tell you, friends, if you're married, I'm going to be really nice to you tonight. If you're married and you have not apologized in the last six months, you either need to write a book and you'll make a million or you need to get right with God, one of the two. Do you know what I believe is the absolute greatest 
qualification for a marriage partner? I tell this to our students at Baptist College Ministry. You know what's your greatest, what you're looking for? The greatest qualification you can ever get in a spouse is this. They're a good forgiver. You say, well, preacher, why? Why is that? Because they're living with you. That's why. Yes, <laughs> they're going to have to be a good forgiver. I tell our students at BCM all the time, you've got a problem, and your problem, you're going to get married, and you're going to carry a big problem into your marriage. You say, Pre preacher, what are you talking about? Well, you're going to bring you into your marriage, and that's big. <laughs> and I will tell you, friends, I don't believe a Christian can be mature if they're not a person who asks forgiveness on a regular basis. Well, I'm not, again, I don't, I'm not perfect on that. I struggle with asking forgiveness just like you do. You know, my flesh does not like to ask forgiveness. I bet you yours doesn't either. It's hard for my flesh to say I was wrong. But you know what I found? If you will say those words, God steps down. He just steps down. And I'll explain it. He just does. Try it sometime, men. Look at your wife in the face and say, honey, I was wrong. You'll be amazed what God will do. Number one, your wife will fall over. You'll call 911, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, you'll have to call the pastor and say, my wife's in the hospital. Okay, but you know, but you, you see, it's big things will happen after that. She might actually like you a little bit better. Okay. Somebody has said, a broken man, a woman, a broken man is irresistible to a woman. But the truth is, most of us aren't very broken, are we? Yeah, we're just justify our whatever instead of saying, I was wrong. Now, ladies, I want to tell you right now, you are a tremendous group of ladies. I didn't see any elbows flying. I didn't hear any female amens. I just want to tell you, ladies, you did a great job in the last few moments. Okay, but anyway, uh, you get the idea. See, you see what I'm talking about, friends? See, you can say, yeah, I believe, yeah, yeah if your brother hath aught against thee, uh, leave there thy gift at the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer. You can believe that, but until you leave your gift at the altar and go and say, I was wrong, I hurt you, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? You don't believe it. See, when you believe God enough to obey him, in dependence on his strength, not yours, he strengthens your faith. He imparts you with righteousness. And people can say, that guy loves God. Okay, how about this? Can you be a mature breather, believer without uh, endeavoring to win people to Jesus Christ? Open your mouth and giving verbal testimony of the gospel. Can you be a mature believer with not doing that, without doing that? And the answer is, no, you can't. You say, well, preacher, I'm shy. I'm just not good at it. Well, I'm telling you, friends, I don't think anybody who started giving the gospel thought they were good at it. You know what we do? We just believe. Can I say this carefully? We, we, I preached the gospel for 40 years, and I'm going to tell you something about the gospel. It's not even fair. Say, what do you mean? It's powerful. You know what the gospel is like? It's like going fishing with dynamite. You light a dynamite, throw it in the pond, all the fish come to the top, you scoop them off the top. You say, preacher, you think yeah, that, I'm telling you right now, the gospel doesn't need help, it just needs to be proclaimed. It's powerful. I've done it for 40 years. I don't care if their hair is green. I don't care if they got earrings, earrings everywhere but their ears. I don't care. It does not matter. The gospel is powerful. It's just unbelievable powerful. It just needs to be proclaimed. And I'm going to just tell you, you may not be the greatest speaker on planet Earth, but don't worry about that. We're not trusting your speaking uh, skills to get people into heaven. We're trusting the message, the gospel. It's where the power of God is. And you will never be a mature believer until you say, you know what? I want to talk to people about Jesus. I may not be the best talker, but you know, I'm going to tell you this. God has uniquely fitted you to win people that probably God has uniquely fitted you to. I, couldn't, I wouldn't be as good as you'd be. I believe God does that. He knows that uniquely you can connect with somebody in a way maybe somebody else wouldn't. God will use that. So, so how about that? Okay, let's go to another thing. Uh, can a mature a believer be a mature believer without exhorting and encouraging other believers to live for God? Can they? And the answer is no. The Bible says, but exhort one another, don't miss this, daily. While it is called today. Can I ask you today, who did you encourage in your Christian walk today? Because everybody can do that, and everybody ought to. It can just simply be your wife. Hey, I'm praying for you today. Encouragement's like putting your arm around somebody and saying, God's good. God can do this. God can use you. And I'm convinced God wants us to do it daily. You say, you really believe that? Well, that's what he said. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe you can be a mature believer and be a, a negative person. 
You say, well, don't you correct people? Sure you do. I, I believe with all my heart, parenting is 90% positive and 10% negative. And if you view it any other way, I don't think you got parenting. I'm not an expert on it. I had wonderful parents. But I will tell you, friends, I, 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 how do I say this? You say, well, you some, you know, isn't parenting correction? Sure it is. Whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as the Father, hang on now, the Son in whom he delighteth. Can I say this? When's the last time you pulled your kid in and said, you know what? God's hand's on your life. God's got big stuff for you. God's going to use you like nobody's business. Now, we got to deal with this because this will hinder what God wants to do in your life. But you've got big things coming. There's not a kid on planet Earth that will resist that. Isn't that what God does to us? Does God pull us in and say, you're worthless. You can't do anything right. Man, can't you? No, that's not how God does it. He said, we got to deal with this. i got big stuff for you. we got to deal with this. You see where I'm coming from, friend? Yeah. Exhortation. That's what exhortation is. It's encouraging people and exhorting them to move forward because God's on the move. He's got big stuff going. Okay, faith triggers. Let me get a few. I had a few more here. I just wanted to go over real quickly here of faith triggers. Um, can a man, how about this one? Can a man be, can a man be mature with, uh, without being humble? And the answer is no. Now, I've got a whole message on humility, can't preach it. But as I mentioned the other night, and I won't say a lot more about it, but humility, you know what humility is? It's just honesty. Humility is pulling the mask off and being real and authentic. Do you know, my friends, I've learned this in the ministry, and this may really shock you, but I've learned this in preaching. Nobody can identify with perfection. That shock you. You know, when I was growing up, I'm going to be honest with you, there were some great preachers, don't get me wrong. But I kind of noticed as I look back, every illustration they gave, they were the hero. I never, ever heard an illustration where they were the dog. You know, are they the, they're the guy in the doghouse. They're the guy that blew it. And I'll be honest with you, I was wowed. I remember as a kid walking out going, wow. Whew. I could never be like that. Now, do you hear me and do not miss this? That's not powerful at all. I'll tell you what's powerful. I've got a friend of mine. He's a medical doctor, but he got a very unique personality, very nervous personality. And probably 25 years ago, I was at Falls Baptist Church. I wasn't even a member at the time. I, I was living in South Carolina, and I was just visiting. And he came forward, and he, and he and came to me and said, Brother Van Gunn, will you pray with me? I think God's calling me to be a missionary. He was at that time an intern. I know this is terrible. Do you know what my first thought was? He'll never make it. I, I didn't tell him that. But I felt like it. I'm praying with him in total unbelief. Like, Lord, please convince him he can't do be a missionary. You know, I'm, you know we're praying out loud, but I'm praying in my heart. I don't think he's, he's, I mean, he's smart, but just a real nervous personality. I thought, he, he's just not going to cut it. He'll never get support. He holds the record with Baptist World Mission. He got a support in less than a year. He had to turn people down. He had so much support. So how did that happen? Everywhere he went, he won somebody Jesus Christ left a trail of converts. You have to understand, if you were to go out with this guy right now, he would witness to two or three people. He's always late. He's never on time because he's always witnessing to people. Your prayer meetings in unusual places. I've had, you know, in the middle of a, uh, of a, you know, kind of an oasis stop on an interstate highway, and he put her arm around me, Dr. Jim, we need to pray right now. So here we are, people going by looking at, we're having a prayer meeting right in the middle of that. That's how he is. But if he were to preach tonight, I love the guy. You, you would listen to him. You'd enjoy his preaching, but he, he'd have the, the, the pulpit would be full with material, be magazines, books, papers, things would be falling off, you know, and, and uh, uh, he, it would be a homiletical disaster. You think, where is he going? You kind of never know where he's going. But when he gave the invitation, this altar would be full. And every time I'm around him, every time, I'll tell you what I do. I walk out and say, God, if you can use him, I think you could use me. That's powerful. And I want you to understand, friends, that uh, humility is just honesty. It's like, man, I got issues. Hey, God could use you because he's using me. That's powerful. I'm just as needy as anybody in this room. I may have different needs than you have. 
I may not struggle with the same issues. I got my own set I'm struggling with. You probably have your own set. But I'll tell you what. I tell teenagers all across America, I need Jesus probably more than you do. And I'm just telling you, friends, I struggle with humility like anybody in this room, but I've learned this, that God wants us to be appropriately honest. And it's not always easy to do that. And sometimes uh, that's hard. And sometimes, don't miss this, it takes a step of faith. And we say, okay, God, I'm going to take a step of faith, and I'm going to get honest like I believe you want me to. And uh, in doing so, that's when God steps in. Okay, so you can't, we've determined, you can't be spiritually mature uh, and not have some humility, okay? So, so here's some other faith triggers. I think we're about done. Uh, well, I could give you some more, but I've got to give you one more. One, just one, and we're done. One, one, and then we'll tie it up. Okay, so here it is. Um, I probably have saved this one to be last because this is the one that, uh, well, let me just put it out to you. How many out here believe you cannot be mature without being separated from the world? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I've grown up in a different generation. And when I was growing up, we heard a lot of messages on separation, holiness, personal separation, separation from the world. We heard a lot of messages. Now, some of them weren't as biblical as I had, would hope today they to be, but, but there are a lot of them that were. Some good old-fashioned preaching on love not the world, be not conformed to the world. By the way, are those verses in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, love not the world, be not conformed to the world. And I'm just going to tell you, just to be honest with you, I feel like, that there's been a reaction to that kind of preaching. Some of it is the preacher's fault. Some of it was not tied closely to scriptures as it should have been. I get all that. But I will tell you, I believe, no offense to you millennials, I think perhaps it's not fully your fault and you Gen Zers. But I see little desire in this generation, our independent Baptist churches, for separation from the world. And I'm going to say to every young person in this room, you will never read Christian maturity without making faith decisions to separate from the world when God leads you to do it. You can talk to any saint in this room who's been around for decades, who has any kind of testimony before Almighty God, and say, tell me about times in your life when you died to certain aspects of the world, and they can tell you. I'm telling I was with one pastor. He talked about he got saved at the very church he got saved at. Uh, he now pastors. He can take you the very so spot and that every day, he gets the spot he got saved. He said shortly after he got saved, they had some guy come in and preach on music. He realized that almost every bit of music he had was a piece of garbage. And so one day, he went out to his burn barrel. Okay, that's, of course, down south. He went to, out to his burn barrel, and he had a stack of records. That dates the illustration. And he walked up that burn barrel, and he threw those records in that burn barrel. And he will tell you, he would not be in the ministry if he had not done that. You cannot reach Christian maturity without making decisions to die to the world. I was talking to a pastor. He said, I grew up in a secular home. It was not a bad home, but a secular home. I went off to summer camp with some Christian kids, got saved on Wednesday. He said, God became real to me immediately. He said, when I went home, he said, I walked into my room. He said, I was a music fanatic. He said, I think it was eight tracks. He said, I, it could have been cassettes, but something like that. He said, I'm a wall full of them. And he said, when I walked in, he said, there was a death metal section. He said, when I walked in, the Holy Spirit said to me, that row needs to go. He said, to be honest with you, before long, the whole wall was gone. But God only knows what we can handle. And he threw the death metal away. My point is this, friends, when you grow in the Christian life, there are times that God's going to bring you to a point where you realize <laughs> Uh, that needs to go. I need to get rid of that. I need to burn that. That needs to go. Or I need to stop wearing that. I remember a girl came to one of our campfire services with a big, huge plastic bag full of immodest clothes. And she said, oh, as a Christian, I'm done with it. I'm not wearing this junk anymore. She threw it on the fire. Now, this is going to shock you. She never wore those clothes again. I know that's a shock. You know what she was doing? She said, I'm done with it. I'm not going there anymore. Separation from the world. Now, I'm going to conclude with this because I want to just kind of, kind of repeat it, and give you an illustration so you can go home with it, and then we're, we're done. Let's just, uh, uh, and by the way, let me just, uh, perhaps I should make this clarification. God works in all lives differently. There are some things God may say for you, you can't have them, somebody else can. Some things are wrong for all of us. But there are some things that are wrong for you, but they may not be wrong for somebody else because they can handle them, but you can't. Everybody's on a journey, and the Holy Spirit will show you. He will. 
You let him, you, and you start, listen, you start following and obeying him, you're going to find in that God-dependent obedience, God will do miracles. There'll be God moments. Okay, so back to our illustration. So what are we talking about? We're talking about this. Okay, we're walking through the Christian life, and God begins to show us an area of obedience. We trust God enough to obey him in God-dependence. In that obedience, guess what God does? He increases our faith. You know what that faith does? It motivates us to take another step of faith. And in that step of obedience, God develops our faith. And in that developing faith, he shows us another step of obedience. And we take that step of obedience, and God develops our faith. Are you getting it? See, it's like this. Let me conclude with this. Several years ago, I was, um, I was just a kid. I think 15, maybe 16. I can't remember. I think it was 16. And I was, um, um, our family was on vacation. We were in Colorado Springs. It was a beautiful day. Pikes Peak was clearly seen. And um, we were at an airport. My dad pastored a church in Durango, Colorado for six years. When he got there, there was a young aspiring businessman who worked for Exxon Oil who was going way up the ladder fast. He, very, very good uh, businessman. He was young and he was carnal. He was not right with God. And so he said um, uh, this particular man uh, was... Um, uh, they were doing things that would just be disobedient to the Lord and all that kind of things. But anyway, uh, in that my dad's church, he came to a point. He told me later, he said, Jim, he, my dad was preaching through 1 Corinthians. Every time my dad took a church, he would always preach through 1 Corinthians because it would smoke out all the, all the carnality. It just smoke it right out. He just preached right through the book. And, uh, and he said that, he said, I came to a point. This is what this man told me before he died. He said, I came to a point where I knew this. I either have to join the group that's trying to get rid of the preacher, which would have been my dad, or he said, I had to get right with God. He said, thank the Lord I got right with God. And, and he became a dear friend of my father for years, years, even though they, they were lived different places, just was a dear friend. So we were out there on vacation, and he was a man of means, and so his sons were taking glider license uh, uh, lessons, and they were learning how to you know, fly gliders. And so there's a 15-year-old kid. I'm 16. He's now a surgeon, a very, a very smart kid. Uh, so a 15-year-old kid comes to me and says, Jimmy, he said, I just got my glider pilot's license. Can I take you up? Now, I'm young, and I'm dumb. So I said, yes. So I got in this glider. He sits in the front seat. I'm right behind him. There's a tow line to the tow plane. The thing takes off, and, and we fly. Of course, I'm enamored with the, you know, Pike's Peak. And, and, you know, we got a plane. I can hear the roar of the engine. I'm not worried. Everything seems to be fine. And he's explaining. He said, what's going to happen is we'll get at a certain height. He said, the tow plane will let us go. The tow plane goes this way. We go that way. And, uh, and we'll take it from there. Okay, so I'm just having a good old time. And he says, okay, get ready now. And okay, so the tow plane goes like this. Goes this way, we go this way. And we're in total silence. There's no more engine. And it hit me. I'm thousands of feet above the air, above the ground, in a paper airplane with a rookie pilot. <laughs> this is not a good idea. And he wanted to show off. He says, Jimmy, you ever heard of negative G's? No, I haven't. Okay, then I felt like 500 pounds. You know what I'm talking about? He says, Jimmy, you ever heard of positive G's? I was wrong. No, I haven't. Pretty soon the dust is coming in my nostrils. You know what I'm talking about? I feel like I'm about to be thrown out of the plane. He's doing this stuff, and I'm telling him, I know I'm not feeling real well. <laughs> I'm telling him this. Well, he's just having a good old time, and all of a sudden we hit something that was like an elevator. It was like, poof, like this, like we went way up. He said, that was a thermal. I said, what do you mean a thermal? He said, you see that plane over there? And I saw a plane, a glider going like this. and was going up. It was going in circles, going up. He said, that's a hot air rising. He said, we get in that thermal. You get in that thermal, and he said, it's like an elevator. You just circle around. It takes you up, pops you out. You fly down. You find another thermal. You go up like this, pops you out, fly down. He said, we can stay up here all day. <laughs> that was the last thing I wanted to hear. But I got to thinking about it. What James chapter 2 is telling us is a thermal. Yeah, you believe God enough to obey him. In that obedience, he strengthens your faith. And when he strengthens your faith, there's another step of obedience that needs to be taken. So you take that obedience and dependence on him, and guess what? He strengthens your faith. Imparted right, imputed righteousness becomes imparted righteousness. And do you see it, friends? As you go up in that glory thermal, people say, wow. 
That's God moments in that guy's life. That guy's a friend of God. And you know what happens? Your faith continues to be nurtured, strengthened, and perfected. Do you see the place of works in the Christian life? Yeah, the only place it's a means, it's a means for perfect, perfected faith, for imputed righteousness to become imparted righteousness and to be called the friend of God. But the real kind of faith always produces obedience or it's dead faith. Could I ask every head bowed, please, and every eye closed? You've done a wonderful job listening, and I'm so grateful for it. The heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you just stand to your feet right where you are? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. In just a moment, I'm going to ask the piano to play, and if God's touched your heart, I just invite you to uh, do some movement, some action, some works, if we could say this. God-dependent works. Just follow Jesus. Obey Jesus. And sometimes I know myself. Uh, following the Lord sometimes can be painful. Hum humbling ourselves is not always easy. It has a pain to it, but sometimes dying to self, is, we all know that's a good thing. So if God touches your heart tonight, I just invite you to come and just put a stake down. Take that step of obedience, hopefully the first of many more God-dependent steps. So as the piano plays, just do what the Lord wants you to do. Would you do that? you bow your head and close your eyes I want to ask you a question and I don't want folks looking around has God dealt with you tonight about something in your life that you believe is keeping you from being a mature Christian and and God you know it's been the Holy Spirit he's used the word of God tonight and brought realization brought conviction to your heart that there's at least something in your life that's keeping you from being a mature Christian with nobody looking around, how many of you would raise your hand and say, yes, sir, preacher, that's me, that's me. God bless you, my friend. God bless you, God bless you, thank you. You can put your hands down, now look this way. Last night we talked about God has some place he's taking us as a church, but he takes us as a church because he takes us as individuals. Do you know what that next step is? T tonight, I think the Lord showed us what that next step is. I think he's saying, there, there it is right there. 
That's what's keeping you, that's what's keeping me from, from moving forward in our spiritual maturity is that thing. I'm challenging you tonight, take that next step. Let's deal with that thing. Now, I'm telling you as your pastor, I'll help you. My wife will help you any way we can. We'll pray with you. We'll, we'll talk with you. We'll look at some scripture. We'll come up with a spiritual plan. We'll just make ourselves dependent upon the Holy Spirit of God. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to do that? I'm not going to heavy hand you. You know me better than that. The Holy Spirit does such a, a, a better job than I could ever do. But may God help us be that way. Amen. Man, what a great night. God's good, isn't he? How many of you glad you're here tonight? Say amen. 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 amen, I'm glad. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. Can you believe tomorrow's Wednesday already? And I, I know folks at Greater Cumberland, we're humbled that you're here with us tonight. But you dear folks at Greater Vision, man, this is what God wants. And I can't wait to see what's on the other side. I can't wait. We prayed, we prepared, we've worked, we're, we've de- humbled ourselves before God. And man, I'm excited to see what he's going to do. We're going to pray. We're going to be dismissed. It's good having my son-in-law, Joel, down here from Michigan. And we're so glad y'all are here. I love you, Joel. Why don't you ask the Lord to bless us as we go?